thank you for being with us here today on this beautiful, rainy January day. Glad you made it out to be with us. We are finishing up our last Sunday on the series of Reset. To get us started this morning, I have to ask you a question. Has anybody ever gotten lost before? Raise your hand if you've gotten lost. Good, good. I might be the king of getting lost. For one reason, I don't pay attention when driving. Another reason, I don't want to think while driving. So I depend on someone else in the car with me to, where are we going? And when no one is with me in the car, even with, well, my GPS is acting all crazy now anyways. It's not, I'm not even on the road it says I'm on anymore, so that's not a help anymore. There are moments that I've gotten lost when I should not have gotten lost. So I might speak as one with a little authority on the art of getting and being lost. A couple things you need to know about those of us who are directionally challenged. We don't get lost on purpose. First thing, we don't get lost on purpose. We don't go out in our start of our day saying, you know what, today, today will be a great day just to get lost. To not know where I am or where I'm going and have no clue how to get back home. We don't do it on purpose. The opposite is actually true. We try our very best to pay attention to the directions it just sometimes when we get unfamiliar territory, we get lost. Second thing you need to know about us. We've learned from getting lost so many times that we never know exactly when it happened. We never know. There's never this moment where it just hits us like, you know what? If I'll go back about 100 feet and take a ride, I should be okay. It never hits us close enough to the place where we can get back on track real quick. For the most of the time, we're driving along on the wrong route, and we just get lost. Maybe today, you're in a season of life where you feel lost. Lost spiritually. Maybe you feel like God's not very close. Maybe you feel like he is distant. Maybe you feel disconnected from Almighty God. Maybe during a time of worship or communion, it just felt like it was hard and difficult, and you just were saying, kind of wish I just wasn't even here today. Maybe today you feel lost. Today we're talking about a Spiritual reset. You know, in the Hebrew language, there is no word for spiritual. If you were living the day of Jesus' life and you went up to Jesus and said, Hey, hey, Jesus, how's your spiritual life? We ask that maybe today. How's your spiritual life, Jesus? He might say, I I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about. But the early church picked up this thought. They said, whatever you do in word or deed, do it in the name of Christ. And so that is saying to us, make everything. Make everything that I do, everything that you do, a spiritual act. It's just becoming more and more aware that Jesus Christ does live within us. And as we live this life, there is his spirit that resides in us, and there are spiritual life that we need to live. So this morning, I'm going to be honest, this morning, earlier... Normally my schedule, Monday is kind of my week, my day. I get everything kind of pretty much together for the most part for that next coming Sunday. Thursday, I do my reviews. Thursday, I was kind of sure where we were going. Friday, a little more sure where we are going. You can pick a lot of different passages of Scripture to talk about having a spiritual reset. And so what we're going to do this morning, we're going to look at some, some things to help encourage us on this journey. We're looking at a bunch of different passages of Scripture to see what God has for us in His Word so that we can walk out of here with something in our hearts and our minds that say, you know what? Maybe I'm feeling lost. 
Maybe I'm feeling distant. Maybe I'm feeling disconnected, but I've got from God's word some things I can do to help me and God get back together so that his spirit truly resides within me. I wanted to give you some spiritual encouragements this morning. First one is from the book of Matthew, chapter 11. You've probably heard it before. A great teaching that Jesus was giving. Verse 28 says this. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Another translation reads it this way. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Jesus Christ is not calling us or inviting us into a transaction. He's not inviting us to do something just mechanical to get connected with him. It is a relational flow with Almighty God. We are, we are like instruments in the band. And God has a job for us to do. And slowly and surely we start to tune our instruments to the director. We start to tune things together as he wants it to be heard. And as we do that, God does something divine around us. So maybe today this verse could be a reset button for you. Maybe today you just need to take a deep breath. Instead of 2018 as the year that you just try your hardest and do everything you know what to do and do the right thing all the time, maybe it's time for us to try stop making it all about us and say, God, it's about you. If you're taking notes, first thing is this. Walk with God. Walk with God. Learn the unforced rhythms of his grace. Walk with God. Be in his word. If this is all you hear of God's word, you're not going to do very well. You be in his word. You be in prayer. You think upon him and ponder upon him and, and allow his spirit to grow within you. First thing I challenge us, encourage us to do, if we want to have a little spiritual reset in 2018, is simply the reminder to walk with God. I love the country that we live in. I love the faith, the, the founding principles of our history. There are a lot of things I love about our country, but there are some things that are less substantial that I love about living in America. College basketball is one. I gave all Virginia fans a pause in that moment. I gave you one chance. It is gone. There we go. There we go. One, one Virginia true blue. I gave all Virginia fans. Took out Duke yesterday. I love college basketball. I love football. I love sports. I love just clicking. You just kind of get to see stuff. You know, one of the things my kids, especially when they're younger, what they loved about America was the all-American, all-you-can-eat buffet society we have. I'm telling you, we would drive by a golden corral. Oh, oh, oh. And my kids would be like, let's go there. Have you ever been to a buffet? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm -hmm. It is crazy. You can have the most fun watching people at a buffet. They come there hungry. They come there focused. They come there motivated. They know what they want to get, and they better get it first because they are eyeing the person down there, and they're heading to the same spot and they walk a little bit quicker. Buffets say a lot about who you are and what you hunger when you go out to eat for lunch today. 
Our hunger drives us. Our hunger determines our actions. Determines what we say, what we do. So in 2018, what's driving us? In the book Celebration of Disciplines by Richard Foster, he says this, superficiality is the curse of our age. The doctrine of instant satisfaction is a primary spiritual problem. And he goes on to say, the desperate need today is not for more intellectual people or more gifted people, but it is for more deep people. The second encouragement, you probably have already figured out in your notes, be hungry. Be hungry. He goes on to add that the primary requisite for depth is a longing and a hungering for Almighty God. That's what Matthew 5, 6 says. Those who hunger and thirst after righteousness will be filled. 2018, what are you hungering for? Are you asking for God to do more in your world? Are you longing for a deeper, more intimate relationship with Him? Are you looking for communication that comes from Him? Divine, something that is meaningful, something that is regular in your life. Your answer to those questions will determine kind of the trajectory of your spiritual growth in 2018. As we hunger for God, I believe that the Spirit wants us to know and to remind us that our hunger drives what we take in. That's what our hunger does. What we desire in life, that is what we will feed on. So what are we hungry for in 2018? I believe God is looking for people who are ready to go the distance. He's looking for people who are ready to, you can say, close the deal. God is not looking maybe for for you to be more flamboyant or flashy. Like if you think of baseball, the picture, the starting pitchers, man, they, they just go out there and they put it all out there. I think God's looking for reliable closers in this life. He's looking for people that will keep the faith this year and finish as strong or even stronger than they start 2 Timothy 4 and 7 says this, My life, and this is Paul speaking, My life has already been poured out as a drink offering to the Lord. You know what he's saying? He's saying, My life has already been a long, consistent series of, of investments. And in the passage, he goes on to say that the time of my death, well, it's, it's near. But he says, I have fought the good fight. I've, I've, I've finished the race. I have kept the faith. That is the type of prayer that I want for myself. That is the type of prayer that we need to have, that we are the type of people that not only start the race, but we finish strong what we have started. And it comes down to, what are you hungering for this year? Now, I didn't put it in your notes, but I'm going to ask you to put that down. What are you hungry for? What is it? Maybe just write on the side of your notes. Maybe you don't have the notes in front of you. Maybe you write it in your Bible. What are you hungering for this year? Because this is what I want you to do. I want you to pull that out every once in a while throughout this year. I want you to remind yourself that this is what God put in my heart, that this is what I need to be hungering for in my life so that when the end of 2018 comes... I can look back on and say, I knew what God put in my heart to hunger for, to desire after. I fought hard for it. I went strong after it. And he was with me and he kept me. And I want you to say, at the end of this coming year, you look back and say, God was faithful. I have finished what he asked me to do in this year. I'm starting to think more and more God is more interested in our longevity of our faith than our fervency at times. I think God's looking at us and saying, will you just do the race? There are going to be low moments, there's going to be high moments, but will you do the race and will you finish? And Will you finish well? 
My encouragement number two for us, be hungry. Third encouragement is this in your notes. Have power. I grew up in the great state of Illinois, not Illinois, as my children make fun of it. You don't pronounce the S. We think we've had winter. In the great Midwest, this is like, I never got out of school. I never, never. They never canceled school. We had a guy in our church that worked with the area and the, the plows, I'm telling you. Those guys never slept. Salt, chains on the tires. It felt like school was never closed. But we had some winters. There was one winter, it was very cold outside. There was a church function that was away from the, the location where we were. So I was thinking, I'm going to be nice to my mom and dad. It was just me at the house at that point in time. All the other kids were gone, about 13, 14, 15, maybe somewhere in there. I'm going to be nice. I'm going to do something good. Maybe I wanted something from them. I'm not sure. I can't remember all the details. I'm going to go warm up the car. It's bitter cold outside. I go out to the car. It was an old diesel fuel car. So I, I put the key in. I just clicked it once, and then, oh, well, the heat's running. Okay, good. This will warm it up. I sit there. Go back inside. It's about 15 minutes later because, you know, it takes a little while. It's just trying to be nice, and the car is good and warm. We go out to the car, get inside. We load up. Dad starts the car. <coughs> Brian, what'd you do? I just clicked it and you didn't turn it all the way on? No. Guess what happened to that battery? Boy, I drained that sucker. Everything that that car needed to move was working, except it didn't have the power it needed. You may feel like you have everything in place for this new year. Maybe you've got your Bible plan ready. Maybe you've got your list of what you're going to do, what you're not going to do, how you're going to change your life. Your whole things are planned out. Maybe you're trying to take care of yourself physically and spiritually and financially and emotionally in all these areas. But if you do not have the power of God living within you, you will not go where you're supposed to go. You may have the wheels on the car, you may have the engine, you may have the steering wheel, the gas pedal, all that stuff, but without the power of God truly living in you, it's just going to look pretty. Here's what 2 Peter 1.3 says this, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. By God's divine power. You have everything you need. Power, from the Greek, it, it's, you've heard me say it before, it's, it's the word dynamite. It's not just a, a little spark of electrical current. It's a serious power that we need if we want to truly live lives that honor God and have a reset in us spiritually this year. My challenge for us is to live a life of godliness for this year. Pastor Brian, that's hard. Yeah. You can't do it on your own. You need the power of the Spirit of God who lives within you. You need to surrender all of who you are to him and allow him to speak into your life, but sometimes I don't think he speaks. Let me tell you, I believe God speaks to us more than we give him credit for it, but many times we don't hear him. Many times we are too busy. I think sometimes we have our, our normal lives that we live and then our <laughs> spiritual life that we live. You know, Monday through Saturday, maybe that's our normal lives and we kind of think of God every once in a while, but though it's Sunday, spiritual lives, put that spiritual life back on. I believe that God wants in his power for those without a doubt to come together and it be an everyday experience of walking in the power of God and living a godly life 
that pleases him and brings him honor. He goes on saying, verse 5, he says, For this very reason, make every effort, say effort, effort, to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge, to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness mutual affection and to mutual affection love. Effort. It's going to take effort for you to follow after God. To live a life that is pleasing to him. He supplies you with the power, but you've got to actually take the steps to do it. Effort, elbow grease, labor, sweat, muscle. Are you going to pursue a godly life? power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us can help us achieve that in 2018. Let's move on. Maybe you're like me at times. There are some days you just don't want to get up out of bed. Anybody ever like that? How many was it this morning? No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Well, well, okay, maybe it was, maybe it was. Maybe it was, maybe it was one of those days, you know, you know, let's be honest. There are some days you wake up where you know that there's things that you're just going to have to go through. That just, maybe it makes you nervous. Maybe it makes you anxious. Maybe it, it stresses you out. Maybe there's something at the job or, or maybe it's a test at school or whatever it may be. There may be some things you wake up in the morning and you just go, can I just go back to sleep? During our series of Reset, I believe God has been kind of trying to speak to me and remind me of this passage. Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. You want to reset spiritually for this year? The encouragement is just to be still. Is it times that maybe we are in the stillness that God's voice actually gets to us? Maybe in this stillness and maybe in a place where we just stop, we have this opportunity to, to know who God is, our creator and our sustainer. If you look throughout the scripture, there's, it, it seems like it's over and over this, this story of God's heart and his concern for our heart. Our heart, I'm not talking about the four chambers that, you know, pump blood through our bodies, but the spiritual heart of who we are, the, the deep-seated emotions, the passions, the place of compassion in us. That place where we feel like the Lord is welcoming us to meet with Him and listen to Him and seek Him every single day. That place where it's most precious to us. If you look through the Scriptures, God is wanting his heart and our heart to meet. And sometimes that can be somewhat scary, if we're honest. The fear of having a heart to heart with God because sometimes we are afraid what we will find out about ourselves. Sometimes we're afraid about, of our past or of our current things that are weighing down on us. Maybe you're here today and you are fearful of how God will respond when you have a heart to heart conversation with him. You know what I've seen in scripture? God responds with grace and mercy. Think of the worst person you remember in the Bible. When they came and encounter with God, they had a heart to heart and their heart was changed the only way it was changed because of the grace and of the mercy of God. Because God wants to change us and transform us from the inside out. Did a little reading on our hearts, our physical hearts, this past week. It does pump the blood throughout our body, throughout our brain, keeps us alive. There's a heart condition that I came across. If I mispronounce it, just correct me after church. 
I knew you would. Tachycardia, I believe is how it's pronounced. That's what Google said. And if Google said it, I mean, maybe we're here today and we have a spiritual tachycardia condition. That's where the heart is beating so fast that it isn't providing life to our body in an effective or sufficient way. And the way they fix this type of problem, they actually get an AED type of thing and they shock and they actually stop the heart for a moment to allow it to kind of get back into the actual rhythm it is supposed to have. Maybe today, maybe today God is looking at us and saying, you are going so fast and doing so much, you just need to stop and be still and let me reset the spirit that is within you, and in that stillness, we can tune into God. Even though you feel like you're going 100 miles an hour, trying to achieve things in life, I think God is teaching us maybe just to stop for a second. Be still. Listen. Hear. Sit with me. Let's have some time together. I think a lot of times we are disappointed with God because we aren't still before Him. We think God should do this and that and the other. And we haven't taken the time just to hear and be with God and allow His heart to affect our heart. Next encouragement. I hope that you're going into this year with some new hopes and dreams. I hope that as you've turned the year, that it, it was a good year last year, but maybe you're bringing into this year some pains and some sorrows and tragedies. Maybe things that you don't understand. Maybe things that make you feel alone. Maybe it's in those moments you've shed a lot of tears and asked a lot of questions. Maybe the question is, God, I, I love you. God, I serve you, but God... What's going on? Maybe you've asked God before a season in your life, shouldn't this be easier? Shouldn't there be some kind of policy, God, where, where I could just skate through the hard times and, and not experience the pain or the suffering or the anguish that everyone else has to deal with? If you're in that season, as you have turned this corner in 2018, maybe we need to ask ourselves, how do I really understand God? How do I understand this relationship I have with God and, and the expectations I've put upon Him? Maybe we need to have a reset. Next one in your notes is this, to have a right perspective. This is common throughout Scripture, but one of the most famous stories is in John chapter 11. There's a family that Jesus loves very much, it says that he loves Martha, that he loves Mary, and he also loves their brother. No one's very confident. Unless it's Larry? No. Lazarus. Yeah. That was the brother, if you couldn't remember. He loves them. Even when Lazarus' name is mentioned, it even kind of has in it that connection of the one you love talking about Jesus loving him. And there's this passage in 11 where Lazarus is sick. They sent word to Jesus. And it says Jesus loved Mary and he loved Martha and he loved Lazarus. So this is what Jesus does. Lazarus is sick. He stays a couple extra more days where he's at. This made people question Jesus. Question his his character, your friend, question this relationship you have with, with this family. If you really love Mary and Martha and Lazarus, you know, he's sick. Aren't you going to go right now? You know, pull him up, make sure he's okay, make sure he doesn't experience death. And Jesus replied and said, Lazarus is already dead, and, at, and for your sakes, pretty much says, I'm glad. Wait a minute. 
Wait, 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 wait. Jesus says that he is glad pretty much that his friend, Lazarus, the one that he cares about, the one, Lazarus, his good bud, is dead. His students, the disciples, couldn't understand why Jesus would be glad about this. Then Jesus says, this isn't going to end in death. This is going to end with God being glorified. So as you've come into this new year, I have to ask, is there something in your life that you just feel like it's, it's on critical condition? Financially, relationally, emotionally, spiritually? We say, Jesus, I, I love you and I, I've served you. It's not supposed to be like this. The hardships, the difficulties, maybe the deaths of something in your life. Jesus promised that we will not experience those pains, those deaths, but what he promises, that it doesn't end in death. And for some of us, maybe we are wondering, maybe these expectations or these promises I thought that God had made to us, maybe it's not actually him saying it, maybe it's just what I hope he would say to me. The point is that God will see us through some of the most painful and difficult times in our lives. It will not be the end, but all of it will be for the glory of God. Pastor Brian, that's not an easy one. No, it's not. That is a hard one. That is a difficult one in this relationship with Almighty God, but it is the truth that He is sovereign that he is in control, that he is still all-powerful and all-knowing. And if we trust him, no matter what you are facing, and as you are faithful to him in his word and guided by his spirit, you can trust in the fact that maybe this is a hard season, maybe I don't understand it, but this is not the end, and God will receive glory when it's all said and done. Maybe that's what you just need to hear for today. Maybe the other things didn't apply to you, but maybe it's that one right there. Maybe for this reset spiritually for you, you just need to have the right perspective. Last encouragement in your notes is this. Be humble. <clears throat> There's a question that Jesus asked two of his top disciples, James and John, what do you want me to do for you? Pretty much kind of the question. In Mark 10, 35, they respond. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now, Jesus has just finished some incredible teachings about discipleship. He's actually talked about the cross, about being mocked, about, about he's going to die. And James and John, verse 37 they said, let one of us sit at your right and the other at the, your left in your glory. Now, if I was Jesus, I'd be going, did you guys listen to anything that I just said? Did you guys just hear what I was talking about? We just did communion as a church body to remember what sacrifice Christ was going through. I can imagine Jesus picturing why aren't you listening? Maybe you're listening, but you're just not paying attention. I wonder how many times God does that to us. When God speaks into our life through his word or through other people, and we know it's his word, and we don't receive it, and we ask something that is so out of the blue, so not with accordance to his word or to who he is. But Jesus responds, verse 38, You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. In essence, James and John wanted what they wanted. They wanted powerful, powerful positions. They wanted to sit on the right and the left of Jesus as the leaders. 
they came to Jesus with the wrong motives. You know what the book of James says about wrong motives? It says this, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Do they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Verse 7, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. James and John, they approach Jesus seeking ambition with selfishness in their heart. Not humbly. But there's another passage for those who'd come and play as we start to close this morning. But there's another passage in Mark 10, 46, where Jesus asked a very similar question. It says, Then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, which means the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. If you need a spiritual reset in your life, I'm going to be honest with you, it is not the hardest thing in the world. It is simply calling out to God, saying, God, have mercy on me. Maybe it's time to put down the remote and pick up the Bible. Maybe it's time to set your alarm a little bit earlier and forget the coffee and just spend time in prayer. Whatever it may be. God, have mercy on me. This is what it says in verse 51. What do you want, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man 